Hi everyone, this is a lecture on the second part of Kingdom Animalia. Uh, this lecture is going to cover both the protostome animals and the deuterostome animals from chapter 31 to 32, including, as you can see, the worms. So just to give you a little bit of perspective about the organisms which we'll be talking about today. Uh, we left off talking about the sponges. Right, so these organisms that are very much um, similar to the colonial coanoflagellates. Um, of course, we see uh, tissue layers developed. Um, of, at first, um, they are organisms are diploblastic, uh, so they only have two tissue layers, and they are radially symmetrical. So they're symmetrical in all directions, um, including the cnidarians, so the jellyfish um, that we saw again the last time. Um, today, uh, we'll be focusing on um, this next clade. Um, so here we have uh, the development of bilateral symmetry, uh, three tissue layers instead of just two, um, and of course with that, a body cavity. Okay, and so as we go through this, um, to a certain extent, uh, it will be kind of a who's who of the animal kingdom. Um, lots of really cool examples. Uh, your focus should be less on, okay, this is really cool, this is what these organisms are called, but more on the actual um, developments, more on the actual uh, adaptations that are going to give rise to these successful groups of organisms. Um, but of course, uh, it's certainly exciting to, uh, to see who's who in the animal kingdom. So um, this first group, we will, or all of these organisms are called the bilateria. Um, again, they are bilaterally symmetrical, and so then we are going to walk through um, groups like the protostomes, groups like the deuterostomes, and then break them down from there. Okay. Uh, so first, let's talk about um, some of these major developments uh, of the bilateria. Um, of course, they are bilaterally symmetrical. Um, so what exactly is the benefit of being bilaterally symmetrical? That is, um, we can make one cut and both the left and right sides are um, a mirror image of each other, as opposed to um, hydra, like we saw in the last lecture. Um, you can bisect it here, you can bisect it along this plane or in any plane, um, and it's going to be symmetrical anyway. Um, first of all, um, bilateral symmetry is associated with cephalization, and anytime you see the root called ceph, um, this means head, and so this really is the development of a head as opposed to um, no head. Right, so this entire group of tentacles here, um, there is no front, there's no back, there's no top, there's no bottom, it's just um, all of these tentacles around the circle. All right, so bilateral symmetry really does give us um, a head, and so what is important about a head is that we can start to concentrate um, particularly nervous tissue in one region, um, of course, within the head. And in a human, we can, of course, understand this, right, the brain is in our head. Right, and um, then the spinal cord can distribute um, commands, right, generated within the brain, uh, to the rest of the body. Okay, and so that is only possible, right? We only have this big um, processing center taking in sensory information, integrating it in some way with memories, with um, information from other parts of the body, and then finally deciding on one final motor decision um, to send out to the rest of the body, we can only have this if we actually have a head, right? So the hydra can't process information. Pretty much every little um, dot right here is a group of neurons, and it makes its own decisions for, you know, whatever it itself is experiencing. And uh, what we can also do is we can condense um, nervous tissue into sensory organs, um, of course, in our head. Um, so even here within this flatworm or planarian, um, there are two little sections here that can actually sense the environment, um, and it can move to or away from light. Um, finally, the benefit to cephalization is that the anterior end in particular, right, so the head end, um, encounters food first, it can see to some extent predators, um, and other important features of the external environment can be detected in the head, and then we can actually uh, move, right, in a very particular direction with our head going first, right? So bilateral symmetry um, allows for more advanced um, hunting, more advanced um, locomotion, uh, more advanced processing and memory, etc. Um, one other characteristic uh, developed by the many bilaterians, not all of them, um, is the development of what is called a coelom. And this is a body cavity um, lined with mesoderm tissue. Now, not all um, 
of the bilaterians have a coelom, but it is very important um, in developing more complex structures. And right now you guys are going to watch a clip um, just showing you the coelom in, or the coela in different um, organisms and talking about why exactly this is so important. The vast majority of the bilaterian animals are coelomates. They possess an internal body cavity or coelom in which organs can be suspended. There are many advantages of this. The coelom allows organs to change their shape and to move without disrupting or affecting neighboring organs. So for example, material can move through a digestive tract and the digestive tract can undergo muscular movements such as peristalsis, which are now isolated from other structures in the body. In protostomes, the coelom is typically fluid filled as opposed to that in vertebrates, which is gas filled. And these fluids then can have important roles in transporting materials, whether this be uh, gases and nutrients or waste, which can later uh, be taken up by excretory uh, structures. This fluid can serve as a hydrostatic structure, giving resistance, which uh, aids the animal in its movement. Uh, this fluid can serve as a shock absorber and to regulate temperature. And cells can move through the fluid, which can now play a role in uh, immunity. So uh, coelomocytes uh, are equivalent to white blood cells in vertebrates uh, that can now protect the organism against infection. And so this body cavity is typical of the bilaterians, although it has been reduced in many lineages. So as you could see from the clip, a coelom has been really important in developing a lot of bilaterian uh, abilities and different adaptations. Uh, but I do want to point out that not all bilaterians have a coelom. Uh, that is, it is not a synapomorphy. Some organisms have gained one and lost it, or some haven't gained a true coelom, or um, have, uh, as you can see here, a pseudocelum. Um, so this isn't a huge distinction that I'm going to make uh, throughout the rest of this talk, but I do want you to be aware that some organisms have um, a body cavity lined with mesoderm only on one side as opposed to on both sides, like, uh, for example, humans or a lot of the bilaterians would. Um, and there are some organisms that remain a coelomate. Um, so again, even though some organisms can have all three germ layers, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, not all of them actually have a true coelom. So uh, to go back to our simplified phylogeny, um, I want to now um, break up the bilateria, okay, so the bilateral organisms into two different groups, the protostomes and the deuterostomes. Okay, so you can see back here that all protostomes and deuterosomes share bilateral symmetry, three tissue layers, and a body cavity. Right? And of course, some are coelomate, pseudocelomate, or acelomate. Okay, and so um, the branch branches off in this direction is the protostomes, and here is the deuterostomes. So we're going to start talking about the protostomes. Um, they are fantastically diverse and very abundant. Um, in fact, if we take a look at all of the um, approximately 30 phyla described as of now, um, about 22 are actually protostomes, right? So the overwhelming majority of uh, animals happen to be protostomes, not humans, but um, most other animals are. Um, and so these protostomes, um, even though um, we might not think of them as um, true animals because, you know, they're not mammals, um, they are fantastically important to us. Um, we eat them. All right. So um, we eat things like uh, the mollusks, for example. All right, so we eat uh, clams, we eat scallops, we eat oysters, right? and so they are a very important food source for us. Um, they provide a lot of uh, ecosystem services, which we're going to talk about later this semester, um, but generally ecosystem services are um, roles that these organisms play um, within the food chain or within the environment that benefit um, us either directly or indirectly. Um, they're not all fantastic for humans. Um, from our perspective, um, they uh, some of these species can be um, harmful uh, to our crops and therefore to our existence. Um, 
some of these species can generate some luxury items such as silk and pearls. Um, some can cause or transmit human diseases um, and are parasites. Um, and we can actually learn a lot about certain uh, protostomes, or we, we can learn a lot about um, animals in general from a couple protostome species. Um, in fact, um, in this talk, we're going to talk a lot about some model organisms and how, as a biologist, you might come across information um, pertaining to these organisms, but we can therefore apply it to um, many other organ organisms within Kingdom Animalia. Um, and two of these most important uh, model organisms are Drosophila, uh, so the fruit fly, um, which if you take genetics next semester, you will learn all about, um, and C. elegans, um, which is um, a roundworm. And so by studying these, uh, particularly in the cases of genetics um, and development, um, we can learn a lot about other organisms, including humans. Um, and so, given the fossil record, we know that protostomes, um, despite their diversity, um, have all originated within the ocean. Um, and so, actually, the story of protostomes actually resembles the story of plants to quite um, a strong degree. Um, like land plants and fungi, protostomes had to transition from living in the water to living in more terrestrial environments and so they faced a lot of the same challenges uh, that particularly plants which which we've talked about a lot um, have had to face um, instead of just one single type of organism like the relative of the karyophytes uh, you know moving onto land um, animals in particular protostomes have made this transition onto land multiple times um, and so we're going to talk about these uh, the, this transition in a very broad um, and simple way. Um, first of all, um, just like with the plants, uh, animals, protostomes, also had to um, develop a lot of new adaptations. Um, and as we talked about very much at the beginning of class, um, these adaptations are not some conscious decision by the animal. They didn't say, oh, here's a problem, here's the solution. Instead, um, it was just a completely chance event. The mutation led to some different type of trait. And if that trait happened to be the solution to a challenge on land, then that particular organism and its descendants would be more likely to survive and therefore reproduce. Right? So um, the adaptations, um, responding to these different challenges of land involved uh, different adaptations to exchange gases all right so getting oxygen out of the air is a heck of a lot different than getting oxygen out of the water um, also desiccation all right just like we saw with the plants desiccation is a huge problem um, and so a lot of adaptations are related to that um, and finally holding their bodies up under their own weight all right just like plants evolved to um, reinforce their vascular system or reinforce their cells so that they could stand up um, against gravity as opposed to you know just kind of sway around the water animals had to do exactly the same thing um, and so um, again just talking about these in very general terms uh, terrestrial protostomes right that actually were able to survive on land they lucked out with the genetic lottery um, they for the most part particularly in the beginning um, had a high surface area to volume ratio and so this image on the side is showing you a flatworm or a planarian um, and what we can see is just a very basic um, depiction of how um, increasing the surface area to volume ratio actually um, increases um, the opportunities for exchange with the environment right so if you are a rounder typed organism you have a lot of space um, a lot of volume inside um, relative to less surface area for exchange to the outside world. Um, but um, a flatworm, for example, here, um, the surface area to volume ratio is much, um, much larger and therefore they can exchange materials across their skin, right? Um, and therefore um, increase, for example, the oxygen that they can actually take into their body. Um, for the most part, um, animals that lived in the sea had um, some kind of gill-like structure. Um, and as we'll see here um, in a couple slides, 
Um, a lot of the very primitive animals had gills that are just kind of sticking off of their body. Right? And so this allows them to have tons of surface area available for catching any rogue oxygen molecule floating around in the water. Um, but once you get out of the water, um, these gills can therefore dry out and they're not able to actually get oxygen out of the air in the same way they can get it out of the water. And so um, animals started to cover over their gills to reduce, to reduce the oxygen loss or sorry, the water loss when they move on to land. So they can actually still get oxygen but not lose water um, in the process. And so this should start sounding somewhat similar to the plant's response to desiccation. Um, the plants had a waxy cuticle and they have these guard cells surrounding the stomata. Um, so very similar um, type of circumstance. Um, on the very same note, uh, many of the early land animals evolved a very similar strategy as the plants did to reduce desiccation, and that is evolving to have a waxy layer to minimize water loss from their body surface. Right? So just like the plants um, evolved to have a waxy cuticle to prevent water loss, um, so too do um, early land animals such as the insects. Right, so insects in particular are adapted to conserve water. They can live in uh, not only terrestrial environments, but arid or you know, very, very dry environments. Um, they have a small surface area to volume ratio, which actually keeps them pretty darn small, um, for better or worse. Um, and their exoskeleton is uh, more or less waterproof. Um, and finally, um, just like the plants had to evolve some way of reproducing without depending upon the water, um, animals too had to depend on a, uh, a strategy outside of the water. And so um, one of many strategies that we're going to talk about um, is um, eggs of insects in particular um, have a membrane that is very resistant to desiccation. Um, as we can see over here uh, to the bottom right, um, snail and slug eggs have a thick shell that retains water, um, even though they, um, you know, can live in very wet environments, their eggs are resistant to water loss. And so, as I said, the protostomes are fantastically abundant and fantastically diverse. But really, what does make a protostome different from the other bilaterian classification? the deuterostomes. And so this image just shows you some very basic um, representations of how these two groups differ. Um, first of all, um, let me remind you that during development, so after sperm meets egg, um, a series of divisions, cell divisions, are going to occur, producing a sphere of genetically identical cells. Now that sphere of cells is going to indent, right, and produce this invagination, as we can see here, right? So this initial hole here, this first um, opportunity for cells to differentiate into the endoderm and the ectoderm, right, this produces this hole, and this hole is called the blastopore. Now, it may seem arbitrary, but one of the primary differences between the protostomes and deuterostomes, and in fact, what gives rise to these names themselves, is the fate of the blastopore. Essentially, the blastopore of the protostomes, or the mouth-first organisms, the blastopore eventually is going to become the mouth. Okay, and so as uh, the process of development continues, um, this invagination here is going to further differentiate, and in many organisms, not all, and we'll get into that, um, it's going to extend out through the other side of the sphere, right, and therefore producing this digestive tube, right? Food comes in here, digestion happens in here, and finally, waste is going to go out of the anus. Okay, so in protostomes, the mouth, is going to differentiate first, um, which means that in the deuterostomes, right, this first site of invagination, this first differentiation of cells is going to develop into the anus. Okay, so finally, when the tube extends all the way out the other side of the sphere, or ultimately the tube, um, that is going to evolve or uh, develop into the mouth. Okay, um, so, Again, protostomes are the mouth-first 
um, derived from the Greek word mouth first. Um, the deuterostomes are the anus first. Um, again, derived from Greek uh, organisms. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, the protostomes develop their coelom or this body cavity from the blastopore initially. Right. And finally, the deuterostomes um, develop their uh, coelom from the gut itself. And so this first invagination here is going to differentiate into not only the endoderm, but also the mesoderm as well. Okay. Uh, there are a couple other uh, distinctions between these different groups. Um, involving, um, you know, the pattern of cell division in the beginning and, you know, whether those cells can grow up to become anything or certain things. Um, and so we're not going to get into that. Um, in fact, um, this clear distinction between protostomes and deuterostomes is not exactly as set in stone as we initially thought. Um, some protostomes um, actually produce their anus first instead of their mouth um, and vice versa. And so um, these are not uh, absolutely rigid classifications. Um, however, just like with a lot of other groups of organisms, we still use these terms to talk about these larger groups of organisms despite the exceptions. What we can say is that the protostomes, um, based on genetic data, so this is as up-to-date as we can be, uh, based on genetic data, the protostomes can be divided into two larger groups. Um, the Lophotrochozoa and the Ectozoa. So these are big fancy words, but let's break it down a little bit. Um, the Lophotrochozoa, um, this is um, a big compound word. Uh, first of all, zoa means animal, right? Um, so these are animals that have either lopho, so lophophores, right here. Um, these um, are structures that function in suspension feeding an adult so it's just a feeding mechanism um, or these organisms have a trochophore right? so troco for trochophore um, this is a special type of larvae um, of course a lot of different organisms have larvae and so larvae themselves are not um, limited to the lophotrochozoa but um, this particular type is found generally only within this particular group. Um, and so the Lophotrochozoa include the mollusks and the annelid worms. And we're going to get into that here in just a moment. Um, the other group is the Ectozoa. And essentially what all of these guys share, so their synapomorphy, what they all um, have in common, is that they shed their cuticle. And so what I have over here on the right is a lobster. Um, here we can see shedding its cuticle here, and here is an insect shedding its waxy cuticle as well. And so the idea here is that all of these animals um, are very resistant um, to desiccation. They have this very um, strong outer shell. Um, they don't have an internal skeleton, so this gives them both structure, protection, um, also you know protection from desiccation. Um, the problem is that these cuticles do not grow as the animals grow, and so every once in a while, depending on the species, um, these shells, essentially, these exoskeletons, have to be shed in order to grow a new, um, a new exoskeleton. And so all of the ectozoa, um, again, zoa for animals, um, these are going to shed their cuticles. And so let's start with the Lophotrochozoa. Um, I just want to show you a couple of the interesting organisms, a couple of the major groups, um, and you know, give you a little bit of uh, background about why, um, you know, why they're cool, what we know about them. Um, so the first phylum out of those 30 um, total animal phyla are the platyalminthes, um, or more commonly the planarians or the flatworms. Um, here is the first time. Um, we've really seen bilateral symmetry in a phylum of Animalia. Um, they are triple blastic, right? So endoderm, mesoderm, um, and ectoderm. And so what this means is that these organisms can actually produce more complex organ systems than other um, uh, diploblastic organisms could. Right, and so what we can see here in this flatworm is that um, it has 
uh, this right here, the gastrovascular cavity. So um, essentially, um, here's the mouth, not in the head. Uh, here's the mouth, so here's where food comes in. Um, it is digested in this gastrovascular cavity. Um, and actually, um, these particular organisms do not yet have um, an anus. And so any waste products uh, from digestion are actually excreted through the skin, right? Good thing they have a large surface area to volume ratio. They have lots of places um, to push wastes out. Um, also, more um, specialization of organ systems. Um, even though these are very primitive animals, the flatworms um, actually have sensing organs, right? So here are essentially eye spots, right? They couldn't um, read a book necessarily, um, but they can sense light, they can sense movement. Um, also here we have oracles, so they can even um, have a primitive sense of hearing as well. Okay, and um, as we talked about before, these are bilaterally symmetrical organisms and therefore um, a lot of their nervous system um, and sensing organs are um, concentrated or cephalized in their head. Um, another cool thing about the flatworms is that they have very impressive regeneration times. That is, um, this poor fella down here um, was a tasty snack for somebody. Somebody took a bite out of the side of him. Um, this might be game over for a human who, you know, we would consider to be a lot more complex, a lot more advanced than the flatworms. But within the next 15 minutes, this flatworm is going to completely fill in this entire gap here. Right, so this probably this bite probably took away part of the digestive system. It took away a lot of nervous system, um, but within um, just you know a very short amount of time, these guys could be more or less good as new. All right, so these are also pretty important um, model organisms, so that we can learn a little bit more about regenerating tissue even in human beings. Um, final point I want to make about the flatworms is that they are hermaphrodites. Um, so essentially they produce both the sperm and egg um, in order to produce new viable offspring. They cannot fertilize themselves, um, but they both fertilize other eggs and their own eggs are fertilized themselves. Um, and so uh, this next clip um, is uh, enlightening perhaps. Um, here, what you're going to see is flatworms floating around and um, undergoing a mating ritual, um, or probably more aptly name a mating competition. So enjoy. Flatworms have both male and female sex organs. But when it comes time to make little flatworms, they have to decide who plays which role. And that they fight over. The two flatworms rear up, exposing their midsections. Those jutting white nibs aren't weapons, at least not intentional ones. They are actually the worm's penises, a double-barreled inseminator, if they can shoot first. Flatworm sex consists of the two attempting to stab their lover with their pointed pair and inseminate each other, an act delicately referred to as penis fencing. But there's nothing delicate about it. Flatworms have been known to gouge holes in each other in battles lasting up to an hour. Why do they cross swords? Producing offspring requires a lot of energy. The winning father can go out and about in the world without any further responsibility. The losing mother absorbs the winner's sperm. It must now work longer and harder to find food and stay alive. The father floats merrily along. The mother crawls along looking for a meal, already the responsible one.
because the flatworms have such a high surface area to volume ratio, they have to remain in environments that are still very wet or else they will uh, completely desiccate very quickly. Um, however, they are not completely limited to the ocean like the flatworms that you just saw. Uh, they do live within your, or they can live within your gut. Um, tapeworms um, and other lovely parasites uh, can live in the very protected and wet environment of your uh, intestines. They can latch on um, onto your intestines and um, essentially hijack your food um, with the same veracity as they uh, pursued reproduction, as you saw in the last clip. We now move to the next phylum, the phylum mollusca. Uh, this is um, a group of mollusks, another trochozoan. And this includes the snails, it includes um, slugs, octopus, squid, etc. Um, and of course, these are all very diverse animals, uh, but they do all share three characteristic features. Uh, first of all, they all have a foot, and not a foot like you would imagine on your own body um, with um, toes and bones and muscles. Um, here, uh, most of these organisms have one single foot. Um, that they actually use um, as kind of a muscular hydrostat, right? So how do you walk, how do you move around with one single foot? Well, these guys um, essentially can contract one portion um, of the foot while they're relaxing another portion of the foot um, and ultimately can wiggle along um, a surface or through the water. Um, also, some of them uh, have cilia at the bottom of their foot um, and they can actually create this wave-like motion in the cilia to propel them along. Um, also, as part of their foot, um, both in uh, the snail that we can see here at the right, as well as the octopus, um, underneath the octopus that we can see here, um, within their quote-unquote mouth, um, what we can see is a specialized um, spiky structure um, that's only seen in this group of organisms that's called a radula, um, and essentially these guys can uh, scrape very hard food off of a surface. So for example, they can scrape up a barnacle off of a rock and they can eat the barnacle out of its shell. Okay. Um, next, all of these mollusks have a visceral mass, uh, visceral meaning organs. And so what we can see is um, a mouth leading to a digestive system. Um, you know, so fairly uh, complex, uh, specialized group of organs. All right, finally, uh, the mantle. The mantle is what secretes what is called the exoskeleton. Um, in many of these species, the mantle is going to secrete um, a shell right, uh, for protection uh, of these invertebrates. There are a couple different groups within the mollusks that I want to talk about. Uh, first of all, we have the gastropods, uh, gastro meaning stomach, pod meaning foot. So these literally are the stomach footed animals. Um, and so in these organisms, they do have cilia on the bottom of their foot in order to propel them along. Um, and uh, in the case of land snails, um, this foot actually acts as a lung. So they're actually taking in oxygen from their foot. Um, there are many different species of snails and they're terribly abundant, um, so much so that they can be um, called the potato chips of the sea, right? And so uh, they eat a lot of things and a lot of things eat them. And so they um, are a really important part of the food web. Um, also, we can learn a lot about snails. Um, the direction of the spiral of the shells on snails can tell us um, about the water quality in an area. Um, we can look at fossilized snail shells and um, get a pretty good idea of what the environmental conditions were um, at different points in history. Um, and also they can be used um, to indicate um, you know, kind of the health of a marine ecosystem because uh, their shells are very sensitive to the pH of the water. Um, and of course, pH is shifting not just because um, of acid rain, but because more carbon dioxide in the air due to um, human activity is going to bring the ocean's pH down and therefore decrease the rate at which they can make shells. All right, just a couple um, uh, interesting species of gastropods, um, poisonous cone snails, uh, just like we saw with the plants. Um, animals, uh, particularly really slow moving ones like snails, uh, have to defend themselves against uh, 
more and more species that are trying to eat them. Um, and so a lot of organisms developed poisons, um, including the cone snails. Um, but again, just like we saw with, um, with the plants, the most poisonous substances can also, in the right context, be used um, for helpful purposes. Right? So um, this cone snail venom has been used um, to develop alternates to opiates. Right? Very important in today's, um, today's world. Um, other kind of crazy species here, uh, the queen conch. Um, so these are those uh, big shells, you know, eight, 10 inches long um, with the organism living deep inside the shell. Um, and so this is of course a really important um, organism within the ecosystem. Um, it eats algae, um, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, what I wanna point out um, in this picture is uh, their reproduction, uh, kind of wild reproductive habits here. Um, of course, the conch is very snow, very uh, slow. It is a snail, um, and so when they do meet up with each other, um, reproduction um, takes a really long time, right? And generally, when uh, the male is finished, um, he moves very right long to the next uh, female right away. It's a very inconsiderate of him, but um, of course, if there is another female around, you are increasing your chances of uh, viable offspring by mating as frequently and as long as physically possible. Um, but the other thing that we can see here is that um, these shells are, of course, huge. And so um, in order to actually um, reach his penis into the female's shell, it has to be really long. Um, and so his verge or his penis is about um, two thirds of the length of his entire body so that he can actually reach her, um, which is all well and good, except for the fact that, um, you know, with his manhood hanging out of his shell like this, um, it leaves it very open to predation. Um, and so it is not uncommon for the verge um, to be uh, eaten by other organisms like crabs. Um, and so the verge of a queen conch actually has the ability to regenerate. So it will actually grow back um, because uh, this has happened so many times that they have evolved uh, this uh, ability uh, to increase their chances of reproducing in the future. That's kind of crazy. Um, all right, last group uh, that I want to mention within the gastropods are the nudibranchs. Um, and these are uh, sea slugs. Uh, and if you uh, plan to have a career in biology or psychology, um, chances are you will get to know these, this group pretty well. Um, the nudibranchs are really important in studying uh, neurons and how brains work. Um, and uh, we will watch a clip right now um, of some nudibranchs. Do you know what these crazy colorful creatures are? They are some of the most overlooked beauties in the deep void that is the ocean. But don't let their looks fool you. Some of these guys have the ominous superpower of being able to eat the most highly poisonous creatures on the planet and then harvest their prey's toxins for themselves, making them some of the most beautiful predators in the open seas. They're called nudibranchs, which are soft-bodied marine gastropod mollusks, part of the sea slug family. They're pretty tiny, ranging from about a quarter inch to 12 inches long. And there are over 3,000 species of these guys. Talk about a big family. The name nudibranch actually means naked gills, which refers to the exposed gills that sprout out of their backs. Some species of nudibranchs can retract their gills in order to protect them. They've got no eyes, but instead have two tentacles called rhinophores located on top of their heads. These things are super sensitive to touch, smell, and taste, which helps the nudibranch navigate its surroundings and locate prey and mates. And they have two of them so they can tell from which direction a scent is coming based on the intensity on each rhinophore. Most mollusks, like snails, clams, and oysters, have hard shells as a means of protection, but not the nudibranch. They actually ditch their shells during the larval stage in favor of other defense mechanisms, which actually has a lot to do with their wild colors. Nudibranchs derive their colors from the things that they eat. 
which includes sponges, anemones, and even other nudibranchs. The colors act as a warning sign to potential predators, since the bright colors are often associated with poison. But some nudibranchs don't just look poisonous. They might be poisonous for real. In addition to adopting the color of their prey, nudibranchs can also retain the toxic chemicals it ingests and save it for themselves. The blue dragon is an especially toxic nudibranch. This guy eats the Portuguese man -o -war, which is a venomous, jellyfish-like ocean floater. Once the blue dragon ingests pieces of the man -o -war, it concentrates its stinging cells and stores them in its long external outgrowths and the blue dragon can actually accumulate a large number of these stinging cells, which makes them even more dangerous than the man -o war itself. In other words, some nudibranchs are poisonous and inedible, while others just pretend to be. Which is actually a solid strategy, if you ask me. Now, as with all strange creatures of the deep, you must be wondering how these guys reproduce. Nudibranchs are actually hermaphrodites, which means they have a set of male and female reproductive organs, allowing them to mate with any other mature and consenting member of their species. And a mating couple can produce up to one million eggs at once. So where can you see some of these things for yourself? All over the world, really, and at all depths. But they do tend to favor warm, temperate, and tropical seas. Although, some species have even been found in Antarctic waters. Actually, new nudibranchs are identified almost daily. So who knows? Maybe you'll discover one for yourself. What would you name a nudibranch if you had the chance? If you're an octopus or a cephalopod, you need to really understand how to use your surroundings to hide. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom, and you see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. Here's some algae in the foreground, and an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Now, Roger spooked him, so he took off, a cloud of ink, lands, and when he lands, the octopus says, look, I've been seen, best thing to do is get as big as I can get. That big brown makes his eye spot very big. So he's bluffing, let's do it backwards. I thought he was joking when he first showed it to me. I thought it was all graphics. So here, here it is in reverse. Watch the skin color, watch the skin texture. Just an amazing animal can change color and texture to match the surroundings. Watch him blend right into this algae. One, two, three. <laughs> And now he's gone and so am I. Thank you very much. So what you just saw was a clip about the nudibranchs, um, and you also saw uh, just how amazing the cephalopods, or specifically the octopus in that last video, um, is at camouflage. Um, and so I'm not going to talk uh, really any more about the cephalopods. I have a little bit of information for you here, um, and I want to point out that um, this book right here um, will tell you all sorts of other things about um, just wild and crazy marine life. Once again, I'm not going to go into crazy detail with these. I just want to give you a couple more examples of the cephalopods, um, a cuttlefish, um, the animal that produces cuddle bones that you might buy at the pet store and give to your parakeet so they can have a little bit of extra calcium in their diet. Um, that is actually produced by this cephalopod, so more like a squid as opposed to um, an actual fish. Um, and finally, uh, a nautilus. Uh, there are countless fossils of, a nau of nautili uh, within the oceans. Um, they look largely the same as they did um, throughout history um, and can live to be pretty old. Um, and final group are the bivalves, uh, bivalve meaning two shells. Uh, these are the clams, oysters, scallops, and mussels. Um, these guys are filter feeders. Um, so what you can see here up in the, this diagram of a clam is uh, the muscular foot. And if you actually sit on the beach long enough, you can watch these guys uh, kind of crawl across um, across the sand and burrow into the sand uh, at low tide or if they're above the waterline. Um, 
and so they can definitely move uh, with this foot. Um, also, they siphon water in. Um, and if we look at this cross section um, down here, we can see that the water is siphoned in um, over a filtration system and then the exit um, or the, the waste then is able to exit. Um, and so these guys really do have a lot of um, complex organs. Um, so here is the gut digestion happens here in almost like a little stomach. Um, and we can even see a primitive heart, right? So actually circulating the contents of this animal. Okay, so now we move on to um, yet another uh, defining characteristic, um, the segmentation. We've talked a little bit about this before because chordates or um, mammals in particular have segmentation. Um, so this is the repetition of parts of an organism's body. Um, and um, if different genes are expressed at different times during development, then you end up with very different structures, right? So this type of leg versus this type of leg. Okay. Um, segmentation isn't only important for the development of um, very different types of structures, uh, but also it allows um, independent movement of the body at different segments. And so you can get a lot more um, mobility um, and frankly speed with more segmentation. Um, and once again, specialized structures. Um, we, of course, have segmentation. Um, not only you know, do we have these segments within our spine, right? Each vertebra, T1, T2, T3, um, is a different segment. Um, but also we have um, segments, uh, for example, within our throat, right? If you run your finger along, uh, along down uh, the front of your neck, you can feel each of those little cartilaginous discs around our uh, trachea. Those are segments. Um, even the fault in our brain, these are all segments. Um, and so that leads us to talk about the segmented worms. Right? So phylum annelida, um, if we zoom in on um, this earthworm here, what we can see is that each one of those little bumps is actually an independent little uh, compartment. Okay? Um, each of these segments, which of course is divided by a septum or a wall, um, is equipped with a little pair of appendages, right? So if we look down here, these little tiny appendages. Um, here we can also see um, the segmented worms have a complete digestive system. And when I say complete, I mean there is a separate entrance for food and at last exit for food, right? And so, um, the animal takes in um, usually sand, in the case of earthworms, um, passes it through its long tube of a digestive tract. Um, and what is particularly exciting about this organism is that it can even store food right, for a relatively long period of time. Right? So what this does is it allows um, the animal to not have to constantly forage. It can hold on to some food and start digesting it later. Um, when the need arises. Okay, um, and one final uh, piece here, there are pumping vessels, right? Oftentimes they're called hearts. Um, they're not technically hearts, there's no chambers or anything, but there are um, muscles that contract in a wave-like autorhythmic motion, um, and that actually propels blood um, around in these blood vessels. And so that really is new. We haven't seen that uh, yet. Um, that is going to distribute the food that was, or you know, the nutrients that were digested, you know, here and here in the gizzard, um, and ultimately distribute it to other segments of the body um, so that they can all be fueled. Um, the anelids. Uh, still are confined uh, for the most part to very moist environments. Um, because of this, they actually don't prevent um, gas exchange across their skin and they do actually breathe through their skin. Right? Remember with the plants, uh, as soon as they got a cuticle on the surface of their leaves, um, 
they couldn't allow for gas exchange, right? The same kind of thing is happening here um, with animals. As soon as they prevent water loss um, via their skin, um, they can no longer get oxygen through their skin. Um, these guys, as we can see, are still pretty wet, and so they can still breathe um, in that way. Um, Next, uh, a lot of these organisms um, are hermaphroditic, that is, they have both male and female parts. Um, as we can see here um, on the right, uh, this is an image of earthworms mating. Um, what you can see is that earthworms have this little um, smoother, thicker part around their body that is called a clitellum, um, and that is essentially um, there for uh, assisting in reproduction. And so what we can see here is two hermaphroditic worms mating, right? Head in an anti-parallel direction. So here is one head and here is another head. Um, and so what they're doing is each one is depositing um, sperm on the other animal, right? So sperm here, and sperm here. Um, and so uh, what that's going to do is, or what's going to happen next is that um, that clitellum, um, that little band, right, is going to slide over the organism and ultimately pick up the sperm that was deposited on the surface of the animal, combine it with the eggs, and um, <clears throat> essentially um, create a little cocoon for those fertilized eggs. Okay, so we have just walked through the trochozoans, right, and now we are going to move into the ectozoans. Um, <clears throat> and so I just want to remind you that the lophotrochozoans um, grow incrementally, right? So when we look at a bivalve, right, so one of the mollusks here, we can see these different layers, right? And so those are pretty much like the growth rings on a tree. Um, so they grow um, continually. Um, they never have to shed that shell and then get another one, as opposed to the ectozoans. Um, they are categorized by the loss of this cuticle. All right, so this is the organism emerging from its old cuticle. So the first group that we'll talk about are the nematodes. These are the round, the round worms. Um, these are non-segmented and generally pretty short. Um, you know, again, very small. They have only about a thousand cells. Um, they can be um, hermaphroditic, so you know, both sexes in one organism, or they can be um, male or female. Um, also. Um, a lot of these guys are parasitic. Um, and we'll talk about a couple examples here in just a moment, but the um, scary thing about them is that um, if conditions aren't favorable, they can actually go into um, almost like a hibernation, right, until uh, conditions are favorable once again. And so a couple examples here are filaria. Um, filaria is um, a nematode that is passed via a host, the mosquito. Right? So in the mosquito, larvae are going to grow up. Mosquito bites an animal, and within that animal, um, the um, sorry, the larvae are going to grow up into adults. But where exactly do they do that in the human body? Well, they do that in the lymphatic system. Um, your lymphatic system is uh, similar to your circulatory system, except for the fact that it is essentially pulling up any of the extra fluid, any of the extra um, proteins and dead cells and all sorts of stuff that accumulates within your tissues. And it's going to kind of suck it up into these vessels and filter it through your lymph nodes before returning all of the uh, that fluid back into your blood. Um, so if you have organisms living in those vessels, of course the flow of fluid is going to stop. And so any um, any limbs distal or farther away from the body um, to that infection um, is going to swell up with that extra fluid. And so um, this here, um, actually both legs um, are infected. Um, with this filaria nematode um, leaving, leading to um, elephantiasis.
And a couple more not so nice nematodes. Um, we'll talk about pinworms. Right, so pinworms are um, another uh, parasite to humans. Um, pinworms are passed fecally, right? And so a lot of times what happens is, um, you know, little kids, you know, don't wash your hands and put their hands in their mouths, right? And so the pinworm eggs and larvae are going to end up in the person. They get into the intestines and they live there for um, however long, and then they pass on to the next host. Right when, um, or after defecation. All right. So again, um, humans swallow their eggs from contaminated surfaces. Um, females uh, leave the intestines through the anus and lay their eggs um, around the opening to the anus. Right. So um, yet another way of passing on is, um, you know, to actually itch. Um, when these females come out um, to lay their eggs and then scratch off the eggs and be passed on to the next person. All right. um, let's see, other uh, nematodes, here we have uh, heartworms. Right. So this is why you give your dog uh, heartworm medication. Um, if this is not treated, uh, it can fill up the heart and of course this heart can no longer pump any blood. Um, and finally, here we have a nematode infection. Um, this uh, particular worm um, has to be removed, you know, by essentially pulling the worm out a little bit every day. Um, and so actually the origin of this symbol right here is pulling these worms out. So they would essentially take, um, in this case it's a match, but you know, any little uh, piece of wood here, um, and they would wrap the worm around um, around the substrate and just twist and twist and twist a little bit every day until finally um, you can get the worm out. So um, the last group um, to talk about in this, um, in this PowerPoint is the arthropods. It's phylum arthropoda, um, arthro meaning joint, poda meaning feet. So this, these are the um, jointed feet uh, group. Uh, three most important features among all of these organisms are the jointed appendages. Um, they have an exoskeleton and they have a segmented body. The arthropods also have um, a fairly large brain connected to um, a ventral nerve cord, right? So what we can see here is groups of neuron cell bodies, so these are called ganglia, um, connected by uh, nerves, right, to control this particular area of the body. Um, so this is definitely different from um, humans, for example, our spinal cord would be up here at our back, um, arthropods, it is on their belly. Okay. Um, unlike the segmented worms, the arthropods have an open circulatory system. Okay, and so what we can see along their back is one big long blood vessel. All right, and so what happens is blood is uh, pumped by a heart, right, and it is pumped um, out of the blood vessels, it actually washes over the surface of all of these other organs, right? Kind of delivering blood, um, you know, mixing with used blood. This is new oxygenated blood, and finally, um, the blood eventually is going to return, hopefully, back into these blood vessels. All right, so this is a relatively inefficient process, um, unlike in a human, which has a closed circulatory system. Um, the arthropods uh, can't deliver oxygenated blood and drain deoxygenated blood from the organs. It, um, the blood is delivered only um, via diffusion. Right. Um, and finally, the digestive system is complete, hooray, both mouth and separate anus. Um, they have generally specialized feeding parts. All right, so here we have mandibles um, that are very specialized for whatever this arthropod eats. 
Phylum Arthropoda is incredibly diverse. Um, everything from the extinct trilobites, right, which is right here, um, to um, the insects, which of course we could spend an entire semester talking about, um, to millipedes and centipedes, uh, the crustaceans, right, crabs and such, um, and the one group that I'm going to talk to you about uh, for the remainder of this PowerPoint is the Chelicerata. Right, so this includes both the arachnids and the meristomata, the horseshoe crabs, which is why this is the one group that we are going to spend a little bit of time on. And so this subphylum um, is characterized by the fact that these organisms have six um, pairs, six different types of appendages. Um, there's a pair of chelicerae, um, so these are mouth parts, and that's what, of course, gives the name um, to this group. Um, all right, so both um, the arachnids, the spiders, as well as the horseshoe crabs, yes, horseshoe crabs are not crabs, they are much closely, more closely related to spiders, um, but the mouth parts on these guys are actually these little furry things right in here. All right, and if you've ever looked at the bottom of a horseshoe crab that was maybe overturned by some waves on the beach, um, you might see these little furry parts. Um, so essentially they grab the food and they kind of push it into the mouth, which is right in between them. A pair of pedipalps, right? So capturing prey, sensing the environment or um, reproducing. And again, in the horseshoe crab, um, we can see, let's see this right here um, can actually latch on um, to a female right, and actually um, allow the male to hold on to her as she kind of crawls up onto the shore. She lays her eggs, he deposits his sperm right on top of the eggs, they bury the eggs and both uh, return to the water. Right, and finally there are four pairs of walking legs right, which is what we would character or we would associate with spiders same thing in the horseshoe crabs right here is one two three and four all right uh unlike many of the other arthropods the chelicerata have no antennae um and they have two body regions uh, the first one is the cephalothorax so this is actually a fused head and thorax together and so this here um, on the horseshoe crab this um, is the cephalothorax, and then finally the abdomen. All right, so then the abdomen would be right here. Um, and um, spiders and horseshoe crabs all breathe um, via what are called book gills or book lungs. Um, on the horseshoe crab, they are right here, right before you get to the telson or what you might have always called the tail. Um, so again, if you've ever looked at the underside of a horseshoe crab, you might see that there are these little flaps. Um, oftentimes they kind of like wave these um, if they're out of the water. Those are the book gills and we'll talk more about them in a future lecture. The horseshoe crabs um, are a species that has been around um, more or less unchanged. So they have not really evolved to have any um, crazy new structures in the last 450 million years. And just to give you a little bit of perspective here, the dinosaurs lived about 230 million years ago to 65 million years ago. So these guys have been pretty much the same for far longer than the dinosaurs have even been around. It's a very um, ancient organism. Um, that still is very much in existence today. Um, surely uh, you've been to the beach in South Jersey and you have seen these um, along the coast um, around uh, springtime, so around April or May. Um, these organisms, um, as I said before, are going to crawl up onto the shore out of the ocean um, and they're going to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs in the sand and essentially they um, crawl back into the ocean and go forth and live their lives. Um, it takes about 16, 17 years for a female horseshoe crab to become reproductively um, active and a little bit younger than that in males. Um, the males are generally a little bit smaller um, and 
again, as I said before, they kind of latch onto the back of the female um, and can hitch a ride onto the shore um, while she lays her eggs. Um, and so if you ever look at the back of one, you might see these little um, white notches right here. That is a female horseshoe crab um, that is reproduced um, enough times to kind of leave scuff marks from the males holding on. Okay. Um, these organisms have very simple eyes and not just two, they have many different types of eyes um, so that they can see, um, but really they are um, clumsy. If they flip over, it is very difficult for them um, to get back over. Um, and kind of everybody uh, wants to get these guys. Um, and so what I'm talking about is that um, they have been um, captured millions of them every year uh, for uh, bait. Right? Um, their blood has um, a, um, a special compound in it, um, hemocyanin, right? as opposed to our hemoglobin. Hemocyanin is based um, with copper as opposed to iron. Um, and so uh, this molecule and some of their um, really specialized white blood cells make the blood of these guys uh, very important in some medical testing and the development of vaccines and such. Um, and so harvesting for medical research, um, medical use, um, has been very popular. Um, when it started to impact their populations, um, more regulations uh, were put on the harvest um, of blood. And so usually at this point, um, harvesters are only taking 10 to 30 percent of their blood, um, but there really isn't a good understanding of what happens to the horseshoe crabs after that, right? So we might be killing them anyway, um, even though we're taking less blood. Um, all right, so um, in addition to being really important um, for us, uh, for humans, the horseshoe crab is a keystone species for um, other organisms, um, and specifically the one that I want to point out um, is the red knot. Um, so the red knot is the bird uh, that is down here. Um, in the winter time, the red knot um, flies all the way to the tip of South America, and it overwinters there. Um, and then in early May, approximately early May, the red knot flies more or less continuously, weather permitting, all the way from the tip of South America to South Jersey. All right. So uh, during this time of year, um, you might see that there are a lot of beaches that are closed. Um, and part of that is uh, to protect nesting sites for uh, endangered birds like the piping plover. But the other reason that a lot of beaches are closed is because the red knots stop once on their way from the tip of South America all the way to their nesting grounds in northern Canada. And so while they're here, um, they're not here for very long, um, they eat one single type of food and that one single type of food happens to be horseshoe crab eggs. And so if we are over harvesting the horseshoe crabs, if we are building up the beaches, right, so there isn't a nesting ground for the horseshoe crabs, if we are destroying their habitat um, and destroying them in any way, we're not only affecting these very ancient, older than the dinosaurs animals, but we are also um, severely impacting the red knot population as well. And so that's why um, beach closures are really important um, to respect. Um, by, you know, stomping around on these uh, horseshoe crab eggs, you are decreasing um, the ability of these red knots to get all the way to their nesting grounds. And of course, this is their one single meal. Um, and if they don't get enough food here, they can't lay as many eggs when they get to their nesting grounds. Um, and also, um, they might not even make it there, right? They might not have enough energy.